الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين على أمور الدنيا والدين والعاقبة المتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله تعالى this is our second session uh, where we were learning about the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah last week when we started I gave a general introduction to uh, tafsir studies and how uh, tafsir was studied and some of the rulings uh, regarding it. Today, inshallah ta'ala, I hope to start, and inshallah we will start at the beginning uh, verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And before I do, what I want to talk about is why I chose to go through Surah Al-Baqarah and some of the virtues that this surah has. Now we know that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a blessing sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a guidance to mankind. It is a book that in it has uh, our salvation if we follow it and act upon it, and if we don't, then this is a consequence you must face. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a guidance. Uh, it guides to that which is correct and upright. Yahdi lillatihi aqwam. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in هذا al-Quran, yahdi lillatihi aqwam. This book, it guides to that which is the most upright. Now, specifically Surah Al-Baqarah, one of the reasons I chose those number one, it is a surah that it contains almost everything. If you want tawheed, the surah talks about tawheed. If you want uh, ahkam and rulings, the do's and don'ts, the prayer, the fasting, this surah talks about it. If you want to learn about hajj, this is the surah to go to. If you want to learn about the people of the past and the stories, this is the surah that you will go to. If you want to learn more about the kind of people there are with regards to the guidance that is being sent down, this is the surah that you want to go to. So one of the reasons why I chose it was because while we are going through these verses, we will be able to uh, expand upon our understanding and knowledge of the deen in general. So when we go through the stories of the Banu Israel, you'll get more information about the people of the past, what did they do, what did they do right, what did they do wrong, what did Allah say about them. You will learn more about the prophets. Prophet Adam is spoken about in the surah extensively, Prophet Ibrahim. So you, your information and your knowledge regarding these things will increase. But also, a lot of rulings are mentioned in the surah, which is why uh, if you, you, your understanding of the prayer, your understanding of hajj, your understanding of fasting, you will learn a lot. Also, many other rulings related to uh, divorce and marriage and the orphans, rulings related to financial transactions, interest and riba, even to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah speaks about uh, when someone is borrowing money and the rulings related to that, loans. So it's a surah that is really extensive in the subject it talks about, which is why I wanted to go through the surah and hopefully we can all benefit inshallah ta'ala. This is why some people, some scholars have said that this surah, if you don't see the overarching theme the general maqsad and objective of the surah, it would look like it's many different chapters put together. And regarding the overarching theme of Surah Al-Baqarah, I'll speak about it in a bit, but let's speak some of the, about some of the virtues and the hadith related to this that the Prophet Sallallahu spoke about. In one narration, the Prophet Sallallahu said, take hold of Surah Al-Baqarah for, uh, recite Surah Al-Baqarah and take hold of it in أَخْذُهَا baraka For taking hold of it and acting upon it and reading it, it is a blessing. And leaving it off is a grief. And the evil magicians and evildoers will not be able to harm you if you're constantly reciting Surah Al-Baqarah. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that on the Day of Judgment, as we know, the Qur'an will be brought as a witness. And the Qur'an will either be against you or for you. And the Prophet mentioned in a narration that the, when the Qur'an is brought forth, it will come as a witness on behalf of those and as a shafi' as a intercede, interceding or inter intercessor on behalf of those who used to recite it. So the Qur'an will be interceding on your behalf if you used to recite it. And the Prophet then said that will be being led by Surah Al-Baqarah. By Surah Al-Baqarah, another narration by Surah Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran, which is the third surah in the Quran, the surah after Surah Al-Baqarah. Now, from here we learn again there is a special emphasis 
on this surah. We know that the greatest single verse in the Quran is Ayatul Kursi, which is in Surah Al Baqarah. We know the Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever recites the last two verses of Surah Al Baqarah, it will be sufficient for him, for the person's protection. We know that the Prophet Sallallahu said that the shaitan does not enter into a house where Surah Al Baqarah is recited. So there are so many different virtues that one can relate to this particular surah, which is one of the reasons why I chose this. So now, what I urge all of you to do is while we go through the tafsir and the explanation of these verses and these ayat, that you try and memorize a portion every week. We have this session once a week, so during that week, maybe if you can try and memorize the portion that we have read or we have explained, and by the time, inshallah ta'ala, uh, if Allah wills, when we are done with this, a tafsir that you have memorized Surah Al-Baqarah which is a great thing and really it's an amazing achievement for not just to memorize the surah but to understand it as well it has been narrated by Imam Malik that Ibn Umar Abdullah Ibn Umar the son of Umar al-Khattab when he learned the surah that it took him eight years and another narration mentions ten years so again it shows you that the way the Sahaba studied the Quran is very different than the way we do it. They wouldn't just memorize the statements. They would truly study the Quran and try to act upon it. طيب. So, why did I choose Surah Al-Baqarah? Because of its virtue and also because of how many uh, of its content. There are, we will be learning about different subject matters, which again is very good for the person that wants a general understanding of the religion. Now, uh, before I enter into the explanation of the surah and the first ayat, I want to mention a few things. One is that, ikhwani wa akhwati fi Allah, my brothers and sisters, that the Quran, uh, it has a maqsad. Every chapter, uh, whether it is a small chapter like, inna a'atayna kal which consists of just three verses, or it is a larger chapter like Surah Al-Baqarah, which consists of 286 uh, verses. The, one, and one might, in the, especially in the larger surahs, one might think that they seem to be talking about different things. One moment we're talking about Adam, then about Ibrahim. One moment we're talking about the people of Israel, then we're talking about the rulings of fasting. And you might think that there is no overarching theme, but there always is. And some scholars have dedicated works to just look at the overarching theme of the surah. What do all of these different things have in common? Now, uh, one famous mufassir uh, that is known for doing that before entering into the surah is Tahi ibn Ashur in his tafsir at Tahrir wa Tanweer, the Tunisian scholar. He will always mention the hidayat of surah or the maqasir of the surah, the objective of this chapter before embarking on the actual tafsir of the ayat. And there are other scholars that did so as well, and there are some contemporary works. Uh, Sheikh uh, Tahir ibn Ashur was technically contemporary, but yes. Al-Muhim, um, so what is the, the maqsad the, or the objective or the overarching theme of Surah Al-Baqarah? Now, ikhwani fillah, it can be summarized into, or it can be said it is the obedience of Allah, the importance of the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the danger of disobeying Allah Almighty. Now, we know this Quran is here to guide us and we must take this guidance on board we must take it and act upon it and in that will be our salvation and we will live a good life in this world and an even better one in the next. If we, if we don't act upon that which is revealed to us, then we will go astray. This point of obedience and a willingness to accept the message and act upon it is what this surah is going to teach you. Now, you can immediately see that in the beginning of the surah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the three types of people there are. In the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about the believers and their descriptions. First, Allah says that this Quran is a alif la mim dhalika al kitabu la rayba fihi hudan lil muttaqin. This Quran is a guidance to those who have taqwa. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people in relation to this guidance that came from Allah into three categories. You have the believers that will be mentioned in the, in the following verses. Uh, those who believe in the unseen, establish the prayer, etc., etc. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that's the first group, the people that accepted the guidance and believed in it, that is one category. They obeyed. 
Then you have those who didn't obey, which are of two categories, the actual disbelievers, those who deny it openly, and they are the kuffar. And then after that, Allah speaks about the hypocrites and the munafiqun that acted as if they obeyed, but deep down didn't. So already you're learning about the categories of people in relation to the guidance. Did they accept it and obey or did they not? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the story of Adam alayhi salam. And now why is that significant? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts speaking about uh, Prophet Adam, and it قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةِ When Allah mentions to the angels that he's going to create Adam, th this story is a story of obedience. Iblis refusing to obey Allah and then being damned and cursed. Adam and Hawa disobeying Allah and then what they did to gain, uh, to gain forgiveness. Again, the theme is obedience and disobedience. So as the Asaf Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, this is an example of your father, Prophet Adam, who made this mistake of not listening to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah told him to not obey or listen to the shaitan. Now Adam, of course, then immediately repents to Allah, which is a lesson that we can take. Sometimes you will make mistakes and you will not obey what you do, do what your father Adam did. As we move along, Allah then takes, tells us about a ummah, a nation, not just a person, but a whole ummah, a whole nation, the nation of Banu Israel, who collectively, or if you will, there are of course good people in them, but as collectively disobeyed so many times. And Allah tells us when Allah starts talking about them, uh, from the surah Ya Bani Isra'il Adhkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum wa awfu bi'ahdi ufi bi'ahdikum wa iya yafurhabun wa aminu when Allah is telling them believe bima unzilta believe in that which has been revealed to you wa la takunu awwala kafirin bihi don't be the first one that denies it and then Allah says to them wa aqimu salah wa atu zaka establish the prayer and give charity again commandments which they will disobey and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells them how they disobeyed and then there is a story that talks about their relationship to guidance and revelation. And that is the story of the cow. Surat, the story that is talking about the cow is named, this, this whole chapter of Surat Al-Baqarah, which means the cow, is named after that one incident. What's the relation? This surah speaks about so many things, fasting and hajj and faith and iman and tawheed and, and prophets. Why was it named after this one incident? Because it is in the moodage. It highlights this theme, which is of an acceptance of the revelation and then obeying it. Because when Prophet Musa, who was getting revelation from Allah, tells his people, the Banu Israel, that there will be a guidance and they, they, uh, tell, they go to Prophet Musa and they tell them that there was a person that was killed. Again, when we get to those verses, I will speak to them about them in detail. But the story goes, they go to the Prophet for guidance. Someone was killed and they wanted to find out who the perpetrator was. They go to the Prophet. That's very good that they went to the Prophet. Then the Prophet gives them, Prophet Musa gives them a commandment. A commandment. Idbahu baqarah. Slaughter a cow. That's a commandment. What should they have done? Do as the Prophet tells you. Do as the Wahy, the revelation tells you. Obey. Instead, what do they do? They start saying, Are you taking us as a mockery? And then they kept on pestering and asking difficult questions and then more detail. And again, something that our Prophet warned us about and said, among the reasons why the people that came before you were destroyed was kathra to masa ilihim. There are um, many questions, especially the kind of badgering questions that wasn't them seeking knowledge, but more so bothering the Prophet wasallam and just uh, the Prophet Musa and just keeping asking him unnecessary questions and unnecessary details. As that story goes along, what does Musa tell them? He says, فَفْعَلُوا مَا تُؤْمَرُونَ he pleads with them, do what you're being told. Obey. And then they keep going and keep going. Now as the story of the people of Banu Israel progressed in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the end, they were an example of a nation, a ummah, that Allah blessed. But then, as soon as they disobeyed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away that blessing. And they became among the lowest of the low.
Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us another example, and that example is the example of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, again, what does Allah say about Prophet Ibrahim? Ibrahim When Allah trialed and tested Ibrahim with commandments, then he acted upon them and completed them and obeyed. An example of one who obeyed. Again, the theme of this surah is obedience. Look at Prophet Ibrahim and how he made him an imam, a leader, one that is loved by Allah. He ended up becoming the khalil of Allah, the close companion of Allah, because he obeyed. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to build the Kaaba, he builds the Kaaba. When Allah tells him to leave his family in the desert, he does. When Allah tells him to slaughter his son, he's ready to do it. He obeys. Ta'a and istijaba. Then, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us these examples, the categories of the people in relation to the guidance they are receiving, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells about Adam as the first example, and Iblis, and then tells us about the nation of Banu Israel, then tells us about the pinnacle of, of hidayah and guidance and acceptance and ta'a and submission, Prophet Ibrahim. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about our commandments. This is where the commandments in Surah Al-Baqarah start. And interestingly enough, one of the Salaf said that Surah Al-Baqarah fiha alf amrin wa alf nahayin wa alf uh, hukmin. There are a thousand commandments and a thousand prohibitions and a thousand verdicts in this surah. So this surah is filled with things that we must do, the do's and don'ts. So after Allah preparing us and telling us of those who obeyed and how they were blessed and those who didn't obey and how they were, uh, they were destroyed, Allah then tells us, okay, so here are your commandments, starting with Tawheed. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, surah 163, says, And the one who is worthy of your worship, your Lord is one. Uh, the most merciful, especially merciful to the believers. And the following verses talk about Tawheed. Later on in Surah, in verse 177, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the other commandments, the prayer and the zakat. And then at verse 183, Allah speaks about fasting. After that, Allah speaks about hajj. After that, Allah speaks about matters related to the family, how to get married, rulings of divorce, etc. Then Allah speaks about financial transactions and their rulings. All of these, what do they have to do with the overarching theme? Well, there are, these are do's and don'ts. Do what you're being told. Obey and stay away from the prohibitions. Until the end of Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then finally gives us another example of the people that flourished in their obedience. And because they obeyed, they were forgiven. The, the second last ayah of this verse is talking about our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions and how they had faith and believed and acted upon it and obeyed. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing we have shortcomings, said the final verse in the surah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden anyone with that which they cannot do. You will have shortcomings. You will make mistakes. If you do, Adam is your example and Hawa, repent to Allah. If you have shortcomings, then remember Allah will never burden upon you that which you cannot bear. This is a general theme, a theme of obedience. I spent way too much time on that because I, wanted, I was hoping to start the tafsir of the surah today, inshallah ta'ala. So now you know. So I want you always to keep that in mind. When we are talking about any aspect of the surah, this is a, the theme of the surah is ta'a and istijaba. Barakallahu feekum. Tayyib. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to start uh, the tafsir now. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim. Thalika al kitabu la rayba fihi hudan lil muttaqeen. Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghaybi wa yuqimuna as salah. ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون الله سبحانه وتعالى استطاع بسم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah أبدأ I start my recitation my learning I start with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking blessings and aid in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, Ar-Rahim, the especially merciful to the believers. These two words, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, 
are among the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ar-Rahman means the most merciful, that showers his mercy upon all of his creation, whether they are believers or non-believers, whether they are uh, animals or humans, it doesn't matter. Allah showers his blessings to upon all of his creation. And this is what the term Rahman means. Ar-Rahim is more specific. It means especially merciful to the believers, which is why Allah says in the Surah Al-Ahzab, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to the believers. Some other scholars have said, Ar-Rahman rahim Ar-Rahman, he is the one that gives, shows mercy and is the most merciful. Ar-Rahim, the giver of mercy. So the first name, Ar-Rahman, is talking about who Allah is, whereas Ar-Rahim is talking about what Allah does. Ar-Rahman, the one who is the most merciful. Ar-Rahim, the one who gives mercy and shows mercy. And Allah knows best. Al-Muhim, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. You will find this in every single uh, chapter of the Quran. In the beginning, it starts with the Basmalah. The Basmalah, is, this is what Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim for short. Scholars call it the Basmalah. You will find it in every single surah except for Surah Al-Bara'ah or Surah Al-Tawbah. And the scholars, they discuss, is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim actually a verse in the Quran? Is it not a verse? And it's just, just there just to separate between chapters? Also, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, is it part of the chapter itself and you add it or is it not? And there is a lot of kalam and the scholars have discussed this. Suffice it to say that the, the strongest opinion is that definitely Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is an ayah in the Quran, it is a verse in the Quran and many scholars have said it is its own verse. It is mustaqil, ayatun mustaqillah. It is a verse that is standing on its own and it is there to separate between the chapters. So it is a verse, it is an ayah, you get the reward of reciting the Qur'an, but it is there to separate between the, um, the surahs, the chapters. It is not part of the chapter, except for Surah Al-Fatiha, which the scholars differ over, and many have said that it's part of it. And also the, the, the verse in Surah Namla, إِنَّهُ مِنْ سُلَيْمَانَ وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ And Allah knows best. طيب. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alif Lam Mim. <clears throat> and whenever we come across these letters, Alif Lam Mim, the tafsir, the explanation of these letters is Allah A'lamu bi Muradi. Allah knows best what they mean. Allah knows what they mean. Now, yesterday, not yesterday, last week when I was talking about our methodology of tafsir, I said, that one of the first places you go to to understand the Qur'an is the Qur'an itself. If not, then the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because uh, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكَرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِلْ إِلَيْهِمْ O Muhammad, we have sent upon you the Qur'an so that you can clarify to the people what has been revealed to them. So, we have no such clarification from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There is no narration from the Prophet telling us Alif, la, mim means this, this, or this. No such thing. So, if we do not have tafsir from the Prophet explaining to us what these terms mean, remember I said among the ways you, you understand the Quran is you refer back to the Arabic language. In the Arabic language, letters by themselves without any haraka, alif, la, mim, they do not carry any known meaning in the Arabic language. So that didn't help either. So then the scholars of tafsir had to understand what these terms meant. And they all, or most of them, there they are, they are some people that made some attempts, but they, they don't have any evidence to back their attempts, whether they, it means this or that, or it's referring to something. But um, the correct opinion is that Allah knows what they mean. Now, does that mean they have no use? No, they definitely have a use. And the huruf al muqatta'a these letters that come in the beginning of surah, they are mentioned 29 times in the Qur'an, or 29 chapters in the Qur'an have these huruf. And sometimes they come in one letters, like noon, wal qalami wa ma yasturun, or qaf, wal Qur'an al-majid, sad, wal Qur'an di dhikr, one letter, noon, qaf, sad. They come in two letters, hamim, yasin, taha. They come in three letters, alif, lam, mim, they also come in four letters. Kaf, ha, ya, ayn, sad. And of course, ha, mim, ayn, sin, ghaf. Tayyib. 
Um, I'm sorry, those are five letters. They also come in four letters, Alif, La, Mim, Saad, in Surah Al-A'raf, and Alif, La, Mim, Ra, in Ra'ad, and the likes. So, it comes in different numbers. You have one, two, three, four, and five. What do they mean? I said, Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best. But the scholars, they said there are a lot of benefits in these letters. And another thing that has been noted is every time Allah does use uh, these letters, it is followed up by a mentioning of the Qur'an. Qaf wal Qur'an al-Majid. Saad wal Qur'an al-Dhikr. Alif la mim, thalika al-Kitab, that book. Taha ma anzalna ilayka al-Qur'an. So whenever these letters are mentioned, the Qur'an is talked about. So what was, um, what is the, the, what are some of the benefits of this? Now as we all know, when our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him, would recite the Qur'an upon Quraysh, Quraysh, the tribe of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Mecca, they didn't like that. And they would try anything they could to stop the Prophet from reciting the Qur'an. And from the things they would do was, they would say, like Allah says in Surah Fussilat, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَا تَسْمَعُوا لِهَذَا الْقُرْآنِ وَالْغَوْ فِيهِ so they would say, that Allah said in the Qur'an, that the disbelievers would say, do not listen to this Qur'an. In fact, drown it out with noise. So whenever the Prophet would try to recite Qur'an, they would drown it out with noise, they would whistle and clap and play and make noises, just so that the Prophet ﷺ would not be able to recite, or so that they would not be able to hear. Now, when the Prophet then would say, for example, Alif, La, Mim, or Ha, Mim, this is something they've never heard of. These people were experts in the Arabic language. They were poets, and they were people that loved poetry, and they would boast uh, over their, their usage of the language and over their comprehension, etc. So then when they hear Rasulullah saying Ha, Mim, they would be like, wait, what? So this would grab their attention. That's why the scholars of the Sita said, be to grab their attention. And that would happen. And then after that, Allah will talk about طيب. So why would it grab their attention? Like the Arabs say, Kullu jadidin lahu ladha. When something is new, something you haven't heard of, you're curious, you want to hear more. So this is one of the reasons why the huruf al maqatta are used. Other scholars have mentioned other reasons as well, such as لِلتَّعْجِيزِ to challenge, to challenge. And this was because uh, Quran, this book, this Quran, it consists of الحروف, these letters. This Quran consists of these letters, Alif, Lam, Mim, and Ha, Mim, and Ayn, Sin, Qaf. These letters that you guys all know is what the Quran consists of. Yet, you guys cannot bring, it, bring even one chapter similar to it. So it's almost like the challenge of these are the letters that the Qur'an consists of. Here they are. Why don't you bring one like it? And we all know, especially in some of the beginning chapters of the Baqarah, when we get there, beginning verses, um, the second page, taqriban, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will pose this challenge. And in the Qur'an, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala poses a challenge uh, to the disbelievers. If you believe that this Qur'an is something that anyone can make, anyone can make up, then bring something like it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first says, لَيْنِ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُ وَعَلَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِرًا Even if the jinn and humankind would come together to produce something like the Qur'an, they would not be able to do so. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easier. Allah said, فَأْتُوا بِعَشْرِ سُوَرٍ Bring ten chapters. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it even easier. You will come in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah says, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِهِ Bring one chapter like it. Even if it's the smallest one. Inna Three verses. Can you produce something like the Quran in its beauty, in its uh, beauty, in its melody, in its rulings, in its wisdom, in its precision? All of, No, no one can do that. Why? Because it comes from Allah Almighty. So these are the two reasons. What I want you to know is Alif La Mim and any other uh, verses similar to it like Hamim and Taha and Yasin and, and Saad that whenever you want to learn this tafsir what is the reason what, is, what does it mean Allahu A'lam Allah knows what are some of the benefits of this at tanbih wa ta'jiz at tanbih to grab their attention right when they hear this and they haven't heard it before it would grab the attention of Quraysh and also lit ta'jiz to, to remind them it is these letters that the Quran consists of yet can you produce anything like it? And the answer is no. 
ولن تفعلوا طيب so بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah the most merciful the especially merciful to the believers ألف لام ميم Allah knows their meaning ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين ذلك الكتاب that is the book now a lot of books of tafsir and translation will say this instead of that this in Arabic words is هذا that الإشارة للبعيد is ذلك we want to say that that over there it signifies that what is being talked about or pointed towards or mentioned is far away ذلك الكتاب Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that is the book لا ريب فيه in which there is no doubt Hudan lil muttaqeen it is a guidance to those who have taqwa so why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say ذلك and not say هذا why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak about the book as if it is far away now one of the reasons ikhwani wa akhwati fillah is that ذلك الكتاب that is the book it shows that it is elevated high up there which is why we require to say ذلك to show how uh, honored and how high uh, and uh, how elevated this book is. Another reason, Ikhwani Fillah, is that when, these, when the Quran was being recited, the, uh, th this, uh, this verse, the Quran wasn't collated and collected, so there was no particular book. So, what book is it referring to? It's referring to the book that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no doubt in it. Al Muhim, the Quran, there is no doubt in it. That is the book in which there is no doubt. La rayba fihi. Ikhwani fillah. When we say, la rayba fihi, there is no doubt in it, it means two things. La rayba fihi, annahum min rabbil alameen. There is no doubt that this Quran is from Allah Almighty. Right? This is the book, or that is the book in which there is no doubt, which is, there is no doubt that it is from Allah Almighty. Because if it was from a human being, you would find it many contradictions. If it was from other than Allah, you would surely find in it many contradictions which there isn't any. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of its predictions, its prophecies, its wisdom, its perfection. It is from Allah and there is no doubt. Also, ikhwani fillah, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه This book, uh, there is no doubt in it. Meaning what? The commandments. And the statements that are in this book are all perfect. Like Allah says in the Quran, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا And the word of your Lord has been perfected. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ The words of your Lord, the Quran has been perfected. صِدْقًا in truth وَعَدْلًا in justice. Truth in its statements and just in its rulings. Just as ruling and truthful in statements. So the Quran is all truth. There is no doubt in it. ذلك الكتاب That is the book. لا ريب فيه In which there is no doubt. There is no doubt it's from Allah. There is no doubt in it. It's all true. Hudan It is a guidance. للمتقين To those who have taqwa. إخواني في الله Taqwa The muttaqin Those who have taqwa Are the pious people. Those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope in Allah's mercy. Those who obey. Those who obey. And remember that overarching theme of this surah is one of obedience. So, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the descriptions and qualities of those who obey. Also, ikhwani fillah, since this Quran is a guidance, if you want to know what that guidance is, if you want to know more detail about that guidance, iqra hadi surah. Read the surah. And in it you will find the guidance that you need. The answers that you're looking for. Fihi hudan. La rayba fihi. There's no doubt in it. Read and you will find most definitely that there's no doubt in it. Alif la mim. Allah knows what it means. Thalik al kitabu la rayba fihi hudan lil mutaqin. That is the book, the Quran, in which there's no doubt, a guidance to those who have taqwa. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people of taqwa, the people who accept this guidance. Who are they? Remember earlier I mentioned that the Quran, I mean that Surah Al-Baqarah will discuss three categories of people, those who accept the guidance and obey, 
those who disobey, which were two categories, the disbelievers that outright disobeyed, and the hypocrites who claimed to be believers but actually were not. In the following verses, Allah will first tell us about the qualities of the believers, then the qualities of the disbelievers, then the qualities of the hypocrites. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts in this verse, the third verse, about who the believers are. Allah says, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ They are those who believe in the ghaib. They believe in the unseen. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ And they establish the prayer. وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And they spend out of that which we have provided for them. Here Allah mentioned three qualities. Number one, أَلَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ They are those who believe in the unseen. إِخْوَانِ فِي الله, this is one of the characters of the believers. They believe in Allah, they have not seen Allah. They believe in Jannah and Nar, they have not seen Jannah or Nar. They believe in the hereafter, they have not seen the hereafter. They believe in the angels and they have not seen the angels. They believe although they have not seen. يؤمنون بالغيب Allah praises the believers and mentions that their first quality is that they believe in the unseen. I want to share with you a hadith and this hadith is mentioned in Mustadrak al-Hakim and many scholars have authenticated including Al-Bani who mentioned that it is Hassan that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he asked the companions a question he said Man a'jabul khalq imanan who has the most amazing iman from Allah's creation and then the companion so the Prophet is asking the companions who do you think has the most amazing iman from amongst his creation? A'jabul khalq imanan. And then they said, when, when the Prophet asked them, they said, Al-Malaika, the angels. Then the Prophet وسلم, said, وَمَا لَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ وَهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ And why would they not believe? Why would the angels not believe and they are with their Lord? The angels are with their Lord. Why would they not believe? And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِهِ وَيُسَبِّحُونَهُ وَلَهُ يَسْجُدُونَ And Allah was talking about the angels. Allah said, they obey him and they believe in him. And they glorify him and they prostrate to him. These are the angels. Of course they would believe. Why wouldn't they when they are with their Lord? Then the companion said that they are al-anbiya, the prophets. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and similar, he said, وَمَا لَهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ and why would they not believe when they are receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then the companion said, Is it, the, is it us, the Sahaba? Then the Prophet said, وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُؤْمِنُونَ وَأَنَا بَيْنَ Why would you not believe? And I am here with you. You met me. You met the Prophet of Allah. And then the Prophet described the people that have the most amazing faith. And they said, they are the people who received suhufan, they received a message, a letter, a book, and they believed what was in it, never having met the Prophet or, or any or, or the unseen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those that the Prophet was talking about in that narration, those whom Allah spoke about in the Quran, and they say, Rabbana amanna bima anzalt, wattaba'na rasul faktubna ma'a shaheedin. Oh my Lord, Lord, amanna bima anzalt, we believe in that which you have revealed. وَاتَّبَعْنَا الرَّسُولِ And we have followed the Messenger. فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّهَيْدِينَ Oh Allah, write us among those who witness the truth. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Tayyib. So, there is so much virtue in believing in the unseen. Um, and as believers, we must believe in the unseen. If you deny the jinn or the angels, you're not a believer. You have to believe. That which is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, you must believe. This is the character of the Muslim. The character of those who accept the guidance and obey is what? يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ And then Allah said, وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ And they perform or establish the prayer. إِخْوَانِ فِي اللَّهِ Allah did not say, وَيُصَلُّونَ And they pray. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ And there is more meaning in إِقَامَةُ الصَّلَاةِ than there is in الصَّلَاةِ or أَن تُصَلِّي to establish the prayer. The scholars of Tafsir said this means and ta'ati bi arkaniha wa wajibatiha wa furudiha wa sunaniha wa mustahabatiha wa hayatiha that you do all of the things included in the salah. You do the pillars, the, the, everything in the salah. You won't leave something off just because it's sunnah. You establish the prayer and pray like the Prophet prayed. Like he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallu kama ra'aytumun li I teach a fiqh class and a lot of times we are discussing in the fiqh class, and at the moment I'm doing the fiqh of the prayer, we discuss 
okay, so this is, what are some of the actions in the salah that if you leave off, your salah is still valid? And what are the actions that if you leave off, your salah breaks? And then we also discuss some of the actions in the salah that you leave off purposely. Does your salah break? For example, let's say you purposely didn't say Rabbi Ghfirli, Rabbi Ghfirli in between the sujuds. Does that break your salah? And the answer is no, it doesn't, it doesn't break your salah. It's among the hayat or the sunan. It is among the recommended act in the salah. Now, that being said, I always repeat this in a class as well. When we're learning the do's and don'ts and the details of the salah and what breaks it and what doesn't break and, and what invalidates it and what if... We're, we're learning about fiqh here, the rulings. But when it comes to our actual salah, we shouldn't be looking at those things. We should pray in the best way possible. Like Allah says, They establish the prayer. Don't do everything. Don't leave off the salat ala nabi in your tahiyat. Don't leave off the dua to, uh, towards the end. Do everything in your salah. Pray like the Prophet prayed. This has the most reward in it. And this will be more likely that you are part of those who accept the guidance. They establish the prayer. Again, out of all the acts of worship mentioned, Allah started with the prayer, highlighting its importance. الذين, uh, those who believe in the unseen and they establish the prayer يفقون, and they spend from that which we have given them Allah said they spend from that which we have provided for them subhanallah again among the characters of the believers and those who accept the guidance from Allah is that they spend from that which Allah has given them first Allah reminds us here that whatever you own Allah gave you Whatever you own, Allah gave you. This is why Allah did not use the word kasaba, what you've earned. No, from that which we have given them, provided for them, because in everything that we have is a provision and a risk from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ Then Allah gives another quality of the believers. They are those who believe. وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who believe in what? بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكَ In that which have been revealed upon you, Muhammad. What was revealed upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? الوحي Revelation. They believe in all that has been revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of the tafsirs they mention, they, they say it is the Quran. Which is correct. But that's not the only thing. It is better to say it is all revelation because even the sunnah is revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Allah mentioned in many places in the Quran that Allah reveals upon the Prophet the Quran wal hikmah and the sunnah. طيب. So, what are the characters of the believers? Verse number three said, they are those who believe in the unseen, establish the prayer and spend from that which we have given them. And that spending could be uh, charity, the zakat, it could be sadaqah, it could even be something that is not necessarily related to money, they also spend, uh, they also uh, that includes those who teach the deen Allah has provided them with the knowledge and they propagate that knowledge, Allah give you wealth, you give that wealth to those who are in need, and here what's interesting is also Allah did not mention who is, is being given to they give from that which we spend, give it to who? You want to learn who is going to give it to? You have to read the surah and you will find more detail. I mentioned in my last week's tafsir that the ayat sometimes will generalize something and you will find more details in another verse. And as we go along the surah, you will find out who you should be spending on. Like Allah says, We say, It is for who? It is for your parents, it is for, your, for, the, for the poor, for the orphans, for those in need, etc. etc. So Allah will give you more details. As you go along. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, the, in, in verse um, 4, They are those who believe in that which has been revealed to you, the Quran and the Sunnah. And that which has been revealed before you, O Muhammad, which is what? They believe in the Torah of Musa and the Injil of Isa. They believe in the Suhuf of Ibrahim and the Suhuf of Musa and the, and the Zabur of Dawood. They believe in all the books that have been revealed, all the scriptures that have been revealed, whether they are named or don't named. Right? Uh, like we said, Amr Rasulullah Rabbihi They believe in that which has been revealed upon you, O Muhammad, and that which has been revealed before you. Min qablika before you. And they believe in the hereafter. 
subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and they believe in the day of resurrection with certainty. Yuqinun comes from the yaqeen, which is to believe with certainty. So they are certain in their belief in the hereafter. Again, among the qualities and the character of the believers is what? That they believe in the hereafter. So how many qualities did Allah give us here? Let's count them. Who are those who accepted the guidance and gained salvation? They are those who believe in the unseen. Number one, they believe in the unseen. They establish the prayer. They spend from that which Allah has given them. And they believe in that which has been revealed to you, O Muhammad. And they believe in that which has been revealed before you. Meaning the previous scriptures. And they believe in the hereafter with certainty. Those are the six characteristics that are mentioned here regarding the believers. Those that have the character trait of those who obey and believe and accept the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do they get in return after all of this? Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَىٰ هُدًا مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that they are upon guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أُولَٰئِكَ they are عَلَىٰ هُدًا أُولَٰئِكَ أَيْ الْمُوصُفُونَ بِهَذِهِ الصِّفَاتِ Those who have these qualities and these descriptions are عَلَىٰ هُدًا مِّن رَبِّهِمْ They are upon guidance from their Lord. وَأُولَٰئِكَ And they are هُمْ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Those who are successful. Indeed, they and only they are the ones who are successful. So from here we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us true success if we embody these qualities. Your belief in the unseen, the establishing of the prayer, the giving of charity, and of course the believing in the Quran and the Sunnah and in the previous scriptures. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us here that uh, they are the successful. I'm going to conclude my lesson here. What does it mean to be successful? If you want to learn what true success is, what are the pillars and the keys to success, I urge you to read Surah Al-Asr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, innal insana lafi khusri. Allah swears by the time, indeed mankind is in loss, except those who have faith, iman, and do righteous actions, and they recommend each other the truth, and they recommend each other patience. These four characteristics will make you among the successors if you do. But what is true success? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Imran, فَمَنْ زُحْسِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدَ فَازْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, whoever is removed away from the fire and enters into paradise has indeed become successful. So, that's success, my brothers and sisters. To be saved from hellfire and to enter into Jannah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who are successful. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds from us and to make us of those that receive the guidance and obey. I'm going to stop here inshallah ta'ala. We carry on next week starting from uh, the sixth verse. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا صَرَوْنَ عَلَيْهِمْ هَذَا وَأَخْرُوا الْعَوَانَ إِنَّ الْحَمْدُ لَا رَبَعَ عَلَيْكُم